Hi, ECS Primary Families. It's Mrs. Bergman. I just wanted to say hello and tell you a little bit more about ECS. Every ECS Primary kiddo has a number of academic blocks per day. Literacy, math, environmental literacy is our third block, and that's a blend of science and social studies standards all blended together. Often it is problem place based learning. Me time is my excellence time where kiddos work on something very specific to them, and that's 30 minutes per day in first and second grade. Specials are 50 minutes per day, and that's one special per day on a five day rotating cycle. So we have PE class, we have Spanish class, music class, thinking lab is science through the lens of art, which is a very exciting class. And then our edible schoolyard is our second grade class where kiddos are in our garden. And there's a little bit of cooking that comes along with that. Discovery block is our kindergarten and first grade block where kiddos are doing play-based activities, promoting physical, social, emotional, and cognitive development. And then every kid, every day, gets 30 minutes of lunch and 30 minutes of recess every single day. ECS has an 11 to 1 student to faculty ratio. We offer differentiated instruction in all content areas, technology integration in every single classroom, and we loop, which is really exciting. So if you come to kindergarten, you are in a self-contained classroom, and those kindergarten teachers are always kindergarten teachers. But as soon as you get to first grade, those teachers in that home base, that's your group for the next year as well. So first and second grade loop in a cycle. So just a little note about transportation. So the district that you live in is where the transportation comes from. So we send the district all of your enrollment information and then they send us back your bus routes, your times, etc. The uniform at ECS, khaki and navy blue bottoms. Tops can be light blue, navy blue, and polo or in white polo shirts. But be prepared to go outside. And I always tell families we're gonna get dirty and we're gonna get wet. So maybe don't buy the white because the stains don't come out of those as easily. Now I'm gonna kick it off to Miss Smile. She's gonna take it from here. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Hi there, my name is Jennifer File. I am one of the kindergarten teachers here at ECS. This is my third year at ECS and second year as a kindergarten teacher and I absolutely love spending my day with the youngest members of our ECS family. So over the next couple of slides, we're gonna be talking to you a little bit about kindergarten. Um, here we go. All right, ECS believes kindergartners are capable naturally curious and have a desire to learn, creative thinkers and problem solvers, and that kindergarten students deserve autonomy to make choices. This is a quote that the kindergarten teachers really love, um, and it's by Mr. Rogers. Play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. What is playful learning? Playful learning is when children develop their imagination and physical, cognitive, and emotional strengths. As they master their world through playful learning, children develop new competencies that lead to the enhanced confidence and the res resiliency they need to face future challenges. Think about how your child or children learn. So an example of this that I really like is in my classroom and in all the kindergarten classrooms, we have a dramatic play area and it changes throughout the year. Um, one of the ones that we had this prior year was a kitchen that my students then turned into an entire restaurant. And with the restaurant, they would write recipes, they created menus, they would have a cash register and they would bring in all of these tools that I had been teaching through the curriculums that we use and they were using them in their playful environment when they were just working in the, in the kitchen and they were trying to measure different things. And when they were creating the menus, they were selling out all of their words. So all of those skills that we were working on, the academic portion of our day, are naturally transferred through play. So that's really, really exciting to watch and it's great to be a part of. This is a little overview of the kindergarten schedule. Um, kindergarten is self-contained. It is the only grade that's self-contained at ECS thus far. 
which means that your kindergarten teacher teaches math, literacy, and environmental literacy. The children do not rotate to different teachers. So in the morning, we have morning free play, morning meeting, which is a really good community building time, math, which is 90 minutes, recess and lunch, which are 30 minutes each, writing and reading workshop, 120 minutes, snack, afternoon structured free play, environmental literacy, which is 60 minutes, and specials, which are on a five-day rotation, PE, music, thinking lab, discovery, and Spanish, and they are 50 minutes each. You're going to hear about the other grades now. Thank you so much for listening about kindergarten, and I look forward to meeting you. Hi, my name is Chelsea Palla, and I am a first and second grade literacy teacher at ECS, and I am teaching first grade in fall 2020. Um, I will be teaching literacy and environmental literacy this year for 1A. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens in the K through five academic blocks. Um, we really try to build our classroom community through choice, wonder, and delight. Our goal is to just like make this community of learners where we feel like a family. So every morning we start with our morning meetings where our friends come together in a circle and each friend is greeted by name and they have a little activity where they're sharing and they're communicating and really building a little family. We also have grade level community time. So I know in my team, every Friday, we get outside to a local field in Frick Park and the kids get to play and track with all four of the first grade, second grade classes, wherever we are. We also have monthly character trait lessons based on each month's character trait. So one month we might be focusing on kindness and we'll read stories and do activities and take kindness challenges. And then the students actually get to vote on who is the student of the month. So it's peers recognizing peers for great um, behaviors, which is awesome. We also have a school-wide positive behavior system. So our students, if they're doing exceptionally well, can get a SOAR card, where a teacher recognizes them for that great work that they're doing. And they get to get that card recognized in front of their class. And they go down to the office and they get a sticker to wear on their shirt. And they get to sign a board. And then at the end of each week, there are names pulled for special winners for the soaring students. We also have classroom positive behavior where students earn eggs to go into their nest in the classroom. And when they fill up their nest, they earn a class prize, which might be something like art with a principal or extra recess or the ever coveted fuzzy friend day where they all get to bring in a stuffy. Moving on, um, this is about literacy in the way a little bit which is kind of my forte in the school. I am a big advocate of the Lucy Calkins reading and writing workshop that we use here at ECS. Um, I know personally, I was not the biggest fan of reading whenever I was in school because we had basal readers and we opened up each day to a page that everybody else was on. And if you didn't like that story, you just kind of had to truck through. Well, this curriculum really allows choice, wonder, and delight where students get to choose a book that they enjoy and that brings them happiness and they get to practice our reading skills on a what we call just right level. So our students are given their level, we know where they are and we help set them up with books that are meeting them at their reading level. And so a normal class would start with me sitting in the front with a mentor text teaching a strategy and then students work on that in partners to gain some confidence on what we're doing and then they work independently just eyes on text reading or pencil in hand writing for a sustained amount of time to build their stamina and really just like overall passion of reading and writing. This program really gives students the autonomy to do what they want while practicing their reading and writing skills. And we've seen a lot of success with this program. In math, we follow the Eureka curriculum, which does focus on common core standards. 
We are working to prepare our students to be thinkers and problem solvers. The overall goal for students is to really understand math and not just memorize. So their way of thinking is kind of the way that adults think about math problems, but we're teaching our youngest minds how to do this from early on, and it gives them such a great sense of reasoning and mathematics skills. Rather than the traditional math of simply doing facts and formulas. We work on students' ability to do complex problems and understand the why to what they're doing, which is so important not to just be doing it like a machine. <laughs> we teach multiple strategies for each skills and students get to have the choice of what works best for them. So through a whole addition unit, you might learn five different ways to add numbers up into 10, but at the assessment at the end, you get to choose which method works best for you and which way helps your brain do the best thinking. Environmental literacy. Um, our homeroom teachers all started teaching environmental literacy last school year in 2019 and, or 18, 19 school year. And it is a wonderful thing to be able to be part of. We follow the science and social studies standards of NGSS and PA state standards for social studies. And we are focusing on a lot of PBL, which is project, problem, place-based learning. We do a lot of outdoor experiences and community connections, and it is incredibly engaging. If you look at that picture there, those are my second grade students from last year. We were out doing a beautifying the Berg activity. So we got out and we walked the neighborhoods near the school and we were picking up trash. And the kids love having that part of being a helpful community member and being a citizen of their community. In second grade, we start a really fantastic unit about identity and learning all about our students so that they can learn about themselves in order to connect to others. And those are just some of the incredible experiences that our kids get to have in environmental literacy. We really try to focus on those 21st century skills of critical thinking, communication, collaboration, character and creativity, and this is such a spotlight for those things in, in our EL classes. Um, lastly, we're gonna talk a little bit about me time, which is my excellence time. This is a unique opportunity that ECS provides to our students. Um, each day, our students are given around 30 minutes to find their excellence through intervention, additional practice, or enrichment. My excellence time is a time each day dedicated to intensely practicing math and literacy skills students have been learning. The groups are differentiated based on our multi-tiered support system, MTSS data. Students split into spaces all across the building and the activities are geared towards supporting and enriching students based on their individual need. Math and literacy me time happen daily in differentiated groups determined by data-driven benchmark assessments. So each day they're put in these groups. These groups are flexible. So if you start day one and you are in one group, you can definitely move into other groups based on what you need. And it's really just a, help, a time for us to help students in small groups to grow as learners. I teach the Discovery Block program in grades K through one and the Edible Schoolyard program in grades two through five. Um, both of these programs have a focus on play, observation, and the sensory exploration of our gardens, as well as the natural community building experiences of playing together, growing food, and sharing it as a community. Um, a typical Discovery class would begin with a mindfulness practice and then we would have play in the garden and then reflect. Oftentimes, uh, when we, before we play, we learn about a play topic. For example, how we can use our imaginations to make an ordinary object into an extraordinary object. For example, we read a book called Not a Stick and we think about all the different ways that we can incorporate sticks into our play in the garden. When available, students can also taste ground cherries, cherry tomatoes, raspberries, strawberries, and some of the other delicious things like mint and uh, rosemary that are growing in our gardens. Beginning in second grade, students move from a sensory and play, um, sorry, sensory exploration and play in the garden to becoming caretakers of the garden. And so they will continue to have some of those um, more relaxed play experiences in the garden, but we'll also begin 
uh, doing things like watering, weeding, and planting seeds and watching them grow. In grades three through five, students will plan, plant, maintain, harvest, and cook the food that grows in the garden. Um, so in the spring and fall, we'll take care of the garden and grow the food. And during the winter, uh, we have units on cooking. Important part of our Edible Schoolyard program is that we integrate content. So um, it is not purely just cooking and growing food, but we think about the literacy, science, math, and cultural connections that are naturally um, available when learning about food and growing food. The common themes throughout these two programs is an emphasis on um, a playful exploration of the outdoors and the outdoor spaces at our school. And this is inspired in part by uh, this quote from David Sobel, which is, what's important is that children have an opportunity to bond with the natural world, to learn, to love it, and to feel comfortable in it before being asked to heal its wounds. Um, and we think that that extends beyond uh, a child's chance to bond with the natural world um, to a child's chance to bond with their classmates and um, to learn to care and love for other human beings in their world. I'm Mr. Rydell. They call me Mr. R here at UCS, and I teach music from K to 5. I have my undergraduate degree from Duquesne University in Music, and I have a Master of Education degree from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Here are some things that we do here in the music department at ECS. The music program at ECS offers many hands-on activities, such as a natural orchestra where we'll do compositions using things found in nature. We use a lot of technology in the classroom. We have iPads for every student where they can go into GarageBand and create original compositions with loops. Quaver curriculum is an online curriculum that I use and is used by over 6 million students in the United States. It offers many studies in performance theory composition and gives activities that the students can do at home by logging on to the interactive website. We also make original movies with iPads using iMovie and I combine with Miss Gregory from PE and do a folk dancing unit. Here are some examples of students that work at ECS. Some are writing original blues songs with original lyrics. Some are creating artwork for the posters for our concert. Some students are using GarageBand to make original compositions. We do a music basketball game, which is an ear training game, which is also fun and very interactive. We also do the folk dancing unit with Miss Gregory, as I described earlier, and the students learn how to line dance and square dance and folk dance and circle dance as far as that. And then we also have new dances that we teach them. In primary school, I use uh, John Fire Robin's conversational solfege which is a really nice solfege package for ear training for the students to really get to know pitches, get to know rhythms, and really learn from the bottom up how it is to sing in pitch, sing in tune, and how to blend. Be musical, artful, and tuneful. Again, students have fun playing rhythm instruments here at ECS along with some African drums. Quavers, as I said, is the curriculum they can do in school and online. And of course, we do a musical timeline. We will go back in time in music starting from the 1930s. We talk about anything from blues to jazz to rock to hip hop to swing. And that will give the students a nice history of the background of music. I hope you enjoyed seeing some of the things we do here in the music department at ECS. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me at martin.rydell. R-E-I-D-E-L-L -L at E-C-S-P-G-H dot O-R-G. Thanks for joining me and I hope to see you guys soon. Stay safe. Hi, my name is Chelsea Young and I am one of the Thinking Lab educators at our primary and intermediate buildings. So I see kids in grades, kinder through fifth grade. Um, the mission of the Thinking Lab is to help students explore meaningful connections between art, science, and design. We always like to say we start with the science concept and have the students um, communicate that through art. And then along the way, we include all of these design thinking skills and design challenges into our curriculum. So we focus on the fundamentals. We start very young with kindergartners um, and work build on that through fifth grade. Just as a backdrop, we use the next generation science standards and the national art standards 
to kind of frame what we um, plan for our units. So we are doing, as I said, science, art, and design integrated together. So in the first photo, you'll notice some students working with light, thinking about how light goes through objects differently, but also uh, sorting objects into warm and cool colors and things like that. So we're finding these natural ways to show how art and, and science and design are just naturally related to one another. The photo um, in the middle, you would see a student creating a uh, cave painting and the natural connection there is um, caves are made of sedimentary rocks, generally. And painting, cave paintings were one of the earliest forms of artwork. So we're teaching them that um, simultaneously. And you'll also see some students working on observational drawings and thinking about living things. So Thinking Lab, science, right? So we're focusing on those next generation science standards, like I've already said. Environmental science is also a really um, important realm for us. And then also thinking about our local built and natural environments. So you'll notice um, students from our school and our class out uh, in the neighborhood and the park finding things for the class. You'll also notice that we have amazing garden beds at both buildings. And we use these for both um, our curriculum, but also for inspiration for what students can create, right? The picture of the students on your right, they're holding images of animals that would be found maybe around Frick Park or Pittsburgh area and they would be animals in one food chain. So we're taking the idea, the science concept of food chains, and then communicating that through a work of art. We also incorporate artist studies, both in our units and in between our units, so that students have that opportunity to practice fine arts just as they are. Um, on the left, you'll notice students working on Georgia O'Keeffe landscapes. So actually this was a science art connection because we were talking about landforms and land uh, landscapes. But they are working on value and showing how things go from dark to light. The students in the middle, they went to visit a uh, an installation by Bordalo Segundo, a Portuguese artist who um, has installed this raccoon at Construction Junction. So we were talking about um, reusing things, not throwing them away. What can you create from trash? And he's done just that. So it's an amazing connection. And then we also have been studying Pittsburgh's very own artist, Baron Batch. And the students here are making splatter paintings, um, both collaboratively and um, individually, in order to practice his techniques. We also um, Design is the third key to our classroom. So students K-5 to are using the design thinking process to work through a variety of problems. Whether it be, can you get this little guy on top of this chair using these materials? Or can you build a prototype of a dog that you have designed for a client? Or how do you get this ping pong ball down this zip line? You know, we're thinking, we're giving them challenges, giving them ways to think through how to solve these um, with other people, which is really, really important to us in Thinking Lab and ECS as a whole. Just wanted to mention um, Artsonia is a platform that we use to share with families student artwork. Uh, our goal is to submit one piece of artwork per student per quarter, so you would be getting a notification um, and you can share that with your family, which we think is super special. Also, um, something really cool about Artsonia is they, you can buy things that have your kids' paintings or works of art on them, like a mug or a t-shirt or something like that. They're like super good quality and um, some of the proceeds come back to us to help with our art program. So we think that's like 
really, really great. Additionally, it's a portfolio that's going to follow your student from kindergarten through fifth grade, and you'll always be able to go back and visit their works of art, which is really special. I hope you enjoy the rest of your tour. Hi, my name is Miss Gregory, and I am the health and physical education teacher at the primary building as well as the intermediate building. And I have a son who is now in eighth grade, as well as a golden retriever puppy. And so we spend a lot of time outdoors and wherever we are trying to make the most of it. I just wanted to show you a few of the um, pieces of equipment we made when we were at home. If you want to try these at home, they're really fun. And so a catapult is where we used a spatula and a spoon and taped them together. I used some hockey tape. And if you step on the spatula and you have a ball in the spoon, it goes flying up and it's a lot of fun to catch. And if you want to catch them, you can even make scoops. And so I have two milk jugs here. We cut the bottoms off and then tape them and then use the handles to catch. And we also made lollipop paddles with cereal boxes. So you could make those and I used chopsticks. And then if you want to decorate them, you can put the tape on the other side and decorate this blank side here. But instead I just used the marketed side. And then the last thing, which it's never too late to do, if you wanna make a bucket list, you can make a fall bucket list or a summer bucket list. This is the summer bucket list that I made and it's just goals of things we can do in the summertime. So it was nice meeting you online and here's a little bit about our health and PE program. The physical education class at the primary school uses four color zones and that is how we have students in their personal space as well as grouping them for small stations. And so four stations, they can rotate around or stay in their station and work on their personal skills or with a partner and then a small group. So four color zones is how we run the class. And you'll see the units that we do, several of them, we go out to Frick Park at the field. And then a couple of them we have in the gym. And so the folk dancing unit, for example, is with Mr. R, our music teacher, and the kids enjoy seeing each other from different classes and dancing together. No matter what we do in physical education, we always try the new activity and their personal best. And I always have enough equipment for everybody. And then the health class is also part of our physical education class. And the units that we do depend on the um, classes that we have in PE. So if I see something that's needed for a certain season or um, safety tips for a certain unit or a boost of confidence for uh, different activities that we're doing, I'll have a health lesson that goes along with that. And then at the end of class every day, we always have um, a water break and we do a peace out, which just allows them to cool down and think their own thoughts and get ready for the rest of their day. If you ever have any questions about the health or physical education program, feel free to email me, megan.gregory at ecspgh.org, and welcome to ECS. Hola, I'm Julie Gallagher. I'm the Spanish teacher at the Environmental Charter School. It is such an honor to be a part of this program, and I'm so glad that you're here to learn even more about it. Spanish at ECS is a new program beginning during the 2019-2020 school year. ECS is a revolutionary school that understands the importance of foreign language learning at the elementary level. In the K-5 program, I focus on an exploration of basic vocabulary and grammar skills in combination with cultural studies. Lessons are created using the ACTFL standards, which incorporate communication, cultures, connections, comparisons, and communities into the ECS Spanish curriculum. Here, you see some of the topics that are covered in this primary and intermediate program. Finally, you'll see some of the classroom strategies and approaches used to make learning a language fun. Hi, 
My name is Kristen A. Sells, and I'm the director of after school here at the Environmental Charter School. Welcome to ECS. I'm going to take a brief moment and tell you a little bit about what we do in after school. And um, I hope that I get to meet you soon as you take advantage of our programming. If you're in need of after school care, we offer extended day, also known as E day. We offer three and five day packages per week. If you decide to use the three day option, the schedule is flexible. So you may change that schedule on a weekly basis as needed. Know that, that after school looks something like this. When your student is done with their academic day, they're escorted by their teacher to extend a day where they're greeted by our after school instructors. What they do is they put their belongings away, and then they move, they get, of course they get signed in, and then they move into the cafeteria where they have a healthy snack and plenty of social time. Once we conclude with that period, we move into big body movement. And that can look different based on the weather, but of course outside is priority. And then we offer indoor activities as well in the gym, or they might choose to do a more social time where it's board games, free art, and playing. After that, we move into our activity periods. And again, based on their age, there's a variety of activities offered every day. Everything you can think of from makerspace to cooking, to free art, to animation, to drama, to dance, to drumming. And for our older students, we even offer a guided homework lab. And then the day, of course, wraps up with more play, especially outside. Again, we're always focused on having our students outside. So I'm gonna warn you now, they're gonna be dirty and they're gonna be tired, but they will be happy if they spend their day with us in E-Day. We also offer a ready care pass, and essentially that's on demand care. So if you have a meeting that's going to run late, or even that your car is going to be at the mechanics, you can simply schedule a one day pass to come into extended day. Now to learn more, visit our school website and there you'll see our tuition rates, our scholarship rates for families that need that discount, and how to enroll. But let me warn you, don't hesitate because our seats are limited in extended day. If you think you're going to need after school, I recommend signing up soon. Before I let you go, I want to tell you a little bit about our clubs. We do offer clubs from grades, first through fifth. And the themes and the offerings change by season. So the best way to learn about clubs is to stay abreast by signing up for our newsletter, following us on social media, and of course, enrolling for the Google Calendar from ECS. There you'll learn all about the clubs, what's going to be offered, what day of the week, the costs, and how to enroll. Clubs are offered in the autumn and in the winter, and we have a spring session too. So again, welcome to ECS. I hope I get to meet you and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beth Flynn. I am the primary school counselor at Environmental Charter School, and I am going to be sharing a brief overview of some of the school counseling services that we offer at ECS. So at the top of this, um, page, I just wanted to note that we do have more information on the website. We are also in progress for developing a virtual learning web page that will have more information that may be more specific to the virtual learning environment that we're in right now. So at ECS, we're really fortunate to have one counselor per building. Um, and actually, in our middle school building, we also house our ninth grade academy. So we have a middle school counselor and we also have one counselor for our ninth grade academy. We're also very fortunate in that our administration supports us to be able to follow our national model um, and make sure that counselors are able to interact with all students. So our goal is to support their social, emotional, academic, and career development. When we explain our role to students, we typically say that we're another person who's here to help be sure that students are feeling comfortable and safe and able to be the best student that they can be. 
So what that looks like is a lot of preventative supports. We push into classrooms with teachers to teach preventative lessons. Um, we hold fun lunches. Those are opportunities for students to have lunch in the counseling office with some friends. And those are primarily for new students or to just help with some peer connections. Students like to have those lunches and they're really fun. So they're usually um, by student request. We also support our new students and students transitioning to new loops of teachers and new grades. We also spend a lot of time with responsive supports. So counselors can work with students who might need some short-term goal-focused work, either in a small group or individually. If we feel like we need to speak with a student on a regular basis, we'll reach out to parents for written permission and talk about that scope and sequence that we're thinking about. If a student's just having a tough day or um, they need a check-in, we can always do that and we can always respond to crisis and support there if needed. We consult with staff, parents, and other helping professionals in the school and in the community. Another part of our work is coordination. So we coordinate and collaborate daily with staff, parents, and outside professionals. We're active members of different school leadership teams like Equity and Culture Committee and Crisis Management. And we chair and facilitate some programs like our Student Assistance Program, GSSU, our Mentoring Program, and Peer Mediation Programs. And we help support a lot of the service learning projects that happen. So for instance, Veterans Day is one of the service learning activities that's typically sponsored by the counseling department. We can help families also with referrals to community agencies. We collaborate a lot with our social workers on that piece. And counselors are the coordinators for many of our 504 service agreements. So if your child um, does have a 504 or may potentially need a 504 service agreement to support their learning, we will be your point person for that. So again, our this is a brief school counseling overview. Um, more information is online and will be um, uploaded to those new web pages soon. Of course, in the virtual world, school counseling looks a little bit different. So we aren't able to push into classrooms in real time, but we do plan to push out classroom lessons virtually um, and still be able to hold some of our small groups and things as needed through Zoom and Google Meets and things like that. If you have any questions about school counseling, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information um, should be available on the website. Um, my email is just my name, beth.flynn at ecspgh.org. Thanks. ECS has two school social workers. Jessica Siegel works with students in grades K to five, and Vanessa Veltri works with students in grades six through nine. Our main goal is to work to remove barriers to success through focusing on three areas, the child, family, and community. ECS school social workers are available to offer support in a number of areas, including connection to family basic needs, mental or behavioral health services, and community outreach. Please feel free to reach out to social workers by phone or email to discuss how we might support your students and your family. Hi, this is Christine Adams from the Environmental Charter School. I'm the Enrollment Manager. Today we're going to talk about um, the enrollment process, how to apply, and then we are going to talk about the lottery and the preferences in the lottery. So how to apply. We use a software system called Schoolmint. So up there at the very top of the form is the address that you use in order to sign up um, for an application and to create an application. Applications every year are open from October 1st and they close January 31st at midnight. Any of those applications received at that time are eligible for our lottery. The documents you need to apply are proof of age. We really like to have a birth certificate. If you don't have a birth certificate, we can use immunization records. If your child does have a sibling that will be attending ECS, we require a birth certificate at the time of enrollment of the sibling. Um, the birth certificate proves sibling um, preference. So our siblings is defined as having one or two or more common guardians or parents um, in common. So just make sure that if you have um, a sibling that you use a birth certificate. Then we need proof of residency. So we need something that's tied to your house. So utility bill, gas, water, or electric, or a public assistant letter will do. Um, and this is probably the most important thing. Once, you, If you have a gas, water, electric, or a public assistance letter, it must be current. So it must be dated after September 1st. So we start um, taking applications October 1st. So we need 
um, any of those documents, but they have to have a date on it of, of, after September 1st. So if you apply and your gas bill was created on August 25th, we cannot accept that. It has to be dated after September 1st of 2020. Um, so just make sure our lottery is validated by a public accounting firm. If you don't have that um, proof of residency dated at that, we will contact you and you'll have to give us another proof of residency. Um, so we can validate that you live in the city of Pittsburgh or you live outside the city of Pittsburgh. So if you don't have one of these above documents, please email Kristen Abe's house at Kristen Abe's house, Kristen.abeshouse at ecspgh.org. Um, so just to let you know, we no longer accept leases because of the ability to just create a lease online. One of the, um, a lot of school districts that we send the applications to don't accept leases anymore. And plus leases are typically 12 pages and we only need one page. And it's easiest to upload one page of utility bill or a public assistant letter. So if you do um, upload a gas, water or electric bill, take a picture of the whole bill um, that has your address on it and everything else. Um, we just need that. If you wanna black out some of the things on the bill, you can definitely do that. Um, but the whole page would be beneficial to have instead of just a part of the bill. So those are the documents. If you need um, any assistance, Kristen Abe's house can assist you in that. So for the lottery, like I said before, any application we receive between October 31st um, between October 1st and January 31st is eligible for our lottery. So if you apply February 1st at 12.01, your application will be marked post enrollment and your application will be added to the post lottery waiting list in the order that it was received. So any of those applications, so if you apply October 1st or you apply January 31st, you're still eligible for that lottery. Um, so just make sure you apply within that. If you apply later than that, your application will be added to the post lottery waiting list in the order that was received. The lottery is always the third Tuesday of February. Lottery results will be received within 24 hours of the lottery. So last year we ran our lottery, the public accounting firm that I talked about before that validates our lottery is there. They um, make sure that the lottery runs smoothly and that everyone is accounted for and then they run a validation of it. And then once they um, sign off on it, we release those records. So I think last year um, it took about an hour. So people received the results within one hour. And so typically the lottery is at 10 a.m. and people had the, um, whether they got accepted or not by 12 that day. So once we run the lottery, there's two emails that go out. So it's either that you got accepted or that you got waitlisted. If you got accepted, you can move on to the registration. If you got waitlisted, you'll have to log back into Schoolmint to check the status of your waitlist number. So once you log in, it will have your child's name, a W and an L and a number. That's your child's waitlist number. If you want to check that number daily, weekly, monthly, you can do that. So you can log on as much. As soon as I let someone off the waiting list, that number changes and goes up one. So you can always check the status of your waitlist number after the lottery by logging back on to Schoolmint. Also, just to tell, let you know, um, if you apply online, um, if you apply with your phone, you can take a picture of your proof of your proof of um, birth and proof of residency it's really easy to upload it right from there so we'll talk about um, preferences in the lottery so who comes first so we have all these different preferences in the lottery and we'll go through each one so our first one is sibling of currently enrolled students so if you have a child already enrolled and you have a child coming in those that's the first preference so we have siblings of currently enrolled students, and that would be in district. So we are a charter school that's authorized by the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Therefore, according to state law, we have to give 
preference to people that live in the Pittsburgh public schools. All of our buildings are in the PPS district, so we have to give preference to Pittsburgh public schools. So we have the first preference is siblings attending in district. Then we have siblings attending out of district. So that would be anyone in sur surrounding districts. So that would be Woodland Hills, Penn Hills, anywhere actually you can apply um, that's out of district. And if you live with, with um, so busing can only be provided if you live within 10 miles of our school. <clears throat> then we have something called siblings applying in district. And that would also be the first preference would be Pittsburgh public schools. So during the lottery, let's say you have a kindergartner and a second grader applying. Your kindergartner gets a spot in the lottery. Then it would go once, because we run the lottery kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to, it will be 10th grade next year. So we have um, kindergarten and you have a second grader. Your kindergartner gets in, the computer goes and tags the second grader and gives them sibling applying preference. Let's say the opposite happens. Your kindergartner doesn't get in and your second grader does get a spot. Then the computer goes back and tags the kindergarten student and gives them preference on the waiting list. So they'll move up the waiting list. Let's say your kindergartner was number 50, your second grader gets in, the computer goes back, pushes your kindergartner up the waiting list to um, whatever, you know, one, unless there's another sibling applying and then it would, it would pick which number came first, which number came first on the waiting list. So, um, it doesn't remove someone that already got those 78 spots, but it does give them preference on the waiting list. And we've never had a time in my four years at ECS that we haven't moved someone off the waiting list. Then we have sibling applying out of district. Then we have a preference called children of school employees, and that would be only ECS employees. They have to work one year, one full year at ECS before they can apply for the preference in the lottery. And that goes in district, which would be PPS, and then that goes out of district. Then our main preference right here would be all those in district students. After we do sibling of a currently enrolled student, sibling applying, employee, then we have the in-district students and we pull from in-district students. Then we pull from out-of-district students. Um, and then we have um, free and reduced lunch additional weight. So in order to increase the economic diversity of the environmental charter school, any child that qualifies for free and reduced lunch gets an additional weight in the lottery. So instead of getting one ticket, they get two tickets. So um, if you, you would get that additional weight in the lottery. So how does the lottery work? So the computer randomly assigns every application a number based on those preference. Um, if you do have twins, because this comes up a lot, if you do have twins, each twin gets their own number. So if one of the twins got picked, then the other one would get tagged a sibling applying preference and then they would come right after them. So the twins do stick together in the lottery. So the computer randomly assigns every applicant a number, and then based on those numbers, they fill those seats. So for instance, kindergarten, ha kindergarten has 78 seats. So they would go through those preference. Siblings of currently enrolled students would come first, in district, then out of district. Then it would be um, as those preferences goes down. So, um, and then we do open up another class in first grade. So we have three kindergarten classrooms of 78 students, um, three kindergarten classrooms of 26 students for a total of 78 students in kindergarten. Then in first grade, we open up an additional classroom. So we have four classrooms of 26 students. So we have 104 in kindergarten, through ninth grade. So that is our maximum amount of students in each grade is 104. So um, if you don't get in in kindergarten, I would say apply in first grade, there's an additional chance to get in. And then even in second and third grade, there's always a chance to get in. So the computer randomly assigns numbers. So what we would do is we'd pick the first 78 and then we would start with waitlist number one all the way down to the end. 
And I wish that I could give you a statistic on the chances that your student will get in. So it changes year to year um, and grade to grade. So some years we have more movement in certain grades and other years we don't. So it just all depends on the year and the grade. So um, I wish I could have a magic ball and let you know. Typically, we see movement in the top 10 to 20 per grade level. It just all depends on the year and the grade. But typically 20, um, about waitlist number 20 might have a chance. So um, I know my son applied for first grade. Um, he applied for kindergarten, he didn't get in. He applied for first grade. I think he was waitlist number 15 and he didn't get in that year. I think he, he ended up waitlist number three for the whole year. So it just, you know, it just all depends. So which seats do you have? So we have the open seats and the wait list that I kind of talked about. So we fill those seats um, and then we create, then we create the wait list. And so don't give up. So the waiting list is active until the school year you are applying for is over. So for the 2021-22 school year, though that wait list will stay active until the year is over. So let's say that your child is number one on the waiting list. And then in January, someone moves, we will offer you that spot. So you can accept or decline that spot and then we move forward. So just to let you know, um, once the, uh, around, once the lottery happens, if you first get in, you will have about till the end of March to accept or decline the spot. And then after March happens, you have three business days to accept or decline that spot. So we typically do onboarding events in March um, and we give the chance of all the students that got accepted a chance to come to the school and see what a day in the life of um, ECS is about. They're on the half days so the parents come and the children come. Children meet their teachers and do some fun activities with the teacher. And then um, parents can go and find out more about the school. Um, last year was our first year that that didn't happen. We, our first um, onboarding event was supposed to be March 13th. And as you know, the whole state of Pennsylvania closed down on March 13th, so we weren't able to have it. But we typically like to get parents and students in to see the school. So hopefully this year we can do something um, to onboard. So we typically invite the first 20 on the waiting list. So if you are on the waiting list, I would advise you to come to those events, um, see what the school is. So when you do get a, an acceptance, or you do get a spot off the waiting list, that you are prepared to make the decision of if you want to come or not because you only really have three business days and you can definitely contact the principal the assistant principal myself chris and abe's house anyone that can help you make that decision so if you have any questions on um, when you get accepted please reach out to us so we can answer any of your questions thank you for joining our open our virtual open house today and hopefully we can see all of you soon